we have um, Ian Bing Bingaman, who is a program coordinator at Youth Ottawa's DELA Youth Program. Ian Bingaman is a teacher in Ottawa and coordinates the Youth Ottawa DELA's Youth Program. He is committed to civic education and his belief that the power of youth to help create a better world today comes from previous experiences in the Canadian Forces and as a stay-at-home father through the DELA through the DELA um, and through the DELA program, Ian has helped over 160 groups of youth to develop and put into action youth develop solutions to the challenges facing their communities. Sarah Andes is the National Director of Programming for Generation Citizen. Sarah graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with dual degrees in Geography and the Plan 2 Honors Program, a minor in French and a Certificate in Social Inequality, Health and Policy. She first became interested in civic participation through her study of how people are shaped by their physical and cultural environments and later shifted focus to how people in turn interact with and affect their surroundings. Following the main presentation, Rebecca Hauer, a Knowledge Exchange Manager, will moderate a group discussion which I will also participate in. Civics in Action, Learning That Changes the World. Today we will hear from Ian and Sarah about the work they do to support young people develop the knowledge and skills necessary to participate in, uh, as active citizens. We know that there's a strong evidence that academic and civic engagement are mutually reinforcing. When young people are supported to an explore an issue of relevance to them and have an opportunity to meaningfully respond, they gain experience uh, practicing active citizenship and are more likely to remain engaged citizens in the future. Active citizenship is more than voting and requires an understanding beyond how a bill becomes law. Active citizenship demonstrates how change can be made in partnership with others and through the democratic process. Civic engagement has been identified in Ontario's Youth Action Plan as one of the seven outcome areas in the Stepping Up framework. Research suggests that engaged youth report better confidence, higher grades, increased levels of physical activity, and enhanced commitment to friends, families, and communities. The vision of Ontario's Youth Action Plan is to see more young people taking a role in informing decisions that affect them, actively and productively engaging in community de development, and able to leverage their assets to address social issues. This webinar will offer evaluated program ideas for connecting policy and practice. So without further ado, I turn it over to Ian and Sarah. So uh, as Lisa was mentioning, my name is Ian Bingham. I coordinate the DELA program for Youth Ottawa uh, in Ottawa. And the purpose of uh, Sarah and I talking together is uh, our program owes so much to what Sarah's organization, Generation Citizen, has been able to do uh, over the past five years working in a number of uh, states in the United States. Um, so what we like to do is talk about this uh, idea of active citizen or action civics, uh, which in effect is really like taking youth and giving them an opportunity to become meaningfully involved in creating solutions to the challenges that face their communities. So again, Lisa mentioned the fact that this goes beyond participating in the traditional forms of civics, whether it's voting or uh, volunteering for a political party, and perhaps more broadly, the non-traditional ways of how can they influence their communities for the better. So to, for this webinar, we thought we would break it down into three parts. Uh, part one, both Sarah and I will discuss our background and approach for both our programs, where we're coming from, where we see the challenge, or where we see the problems that we want to address, and the challenge that we do. Um, part two is we'll talk about uh, the results and our evaluation. Uh, and part three is uh, we will leave you with some guiding principles and lessons that we have learned, uh, we'll say, the hard way. Uh, through our experiences in, in trying to motivate and engage youth to take action on the issues that matter to them. So for part one, uh, we'll break this down to four parts. We'll talk about understanding the problem uh, of youth civic engagement. Uh, number two, we'll talk about our mission statements and a little bit about our theories of change. How do we think that um, the actions that we take will uh, result in the, action, the, the impacts that we want? Uh, number three, we'll talk about the generation citizen model. And because, again, the Youth Ottawa DELA program is, a, is based on the Generation Citizen, we'll talk a little bit about the, the local adaptations that we've had to make here in an Ontario context. So for understanding the challenge, I think a lot of us will um, agree that there seems to be a sense broadly of a dearth of democracy, particularly among youth. Uh, and I think for us it gets to the heart of it of um, the quote by Confucius, 
uh, where I hear, I forget, I see, I remember, and I do and understand. And I think that one of the things we need to remember is that democracy is an active thing. It requires people to be active in it. And it requires, then, training. You know, we wouldn't expect a surgeon to come to us as we're going for an operation and say, so I read about this in a book. I've never done it before, but trust me. So if we want to have the hand, our democracy in the hands of capable citizens, we need to give them an opportunity to try it. Uh, Sarah, did you want to address uh, where you're coming from in the American context? Yeah, I. Um, it's thanks so much, Ian, and thanks for the great introduction, Lisa. Um, we basically, the dearth of democracy very much applies to uh, observations of what's going on in the American political system, too, here. Um, and what we've shared on the left-hand side is a quote by Barack Obama, really uh, echoing what Ian's talking about in the sense of it being the responsibility of every citizen to stay active in our public life. And then the Confucius quote reinforcing the fact that in order for um, our, our neighbors and our communities to develop that type of political activity, we've got to practice that type of political activity and make sure that people know what that engagement looks like before we're expecting and taking for granted that, that everyone can do that on their own. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, more specifically to the Ontario context, uh, where we're coming from, the data is that uh, Ontario, and this comes from the Canadian Index of Wellbeing Report that uh, the Trillium Foundation commissioned, Ontario actually has the lowest democratic engagement level, um, just in general among the uh, Canadian provinces and territories, and youth in the 18-24 is the lowest voting bracket. So again, that's just by those traditional measures, but that's still a problem. Um, we found that actually volunteering has gone up at the same time as democratic engagement has gone down. Uh, and in a similar uh, a kind of related thing is that uh, one of the things is what school is doing. So recently, or within at least the last 10 or so years, we've introduced the idea of a grade 10 civics course. Uh, and that's kind of getting back to something schools, I think, used to be for training citizens. And probably the last 30 years we've seen kind of a, a movement towards more like training for skills that you would need for the job market. Uh, so again, the grade 10 civics course, for anyone who's not familiar, it's every grade 10 student must take it. It's a half semester course, so it only runs for about 10 weeks, and it actually winds up being the most failed course in Ontario. So not only do we have um, this kind of dearth of democracy, you know, we at least are making a, a, a recognition that we have to teach this, but again, we're finding that it's the most failed course in Ontario, and if you would poll any uh, student who had taken grade 10 civics, um, it's generally the one that students will tend to like the least. Uh, so that's what we're looking. We're not really doing a good job of engaging the youth uh, meaningfully in learning about civics. So Generation Citizens' approach to this, our mission, is to ensure that every student in the United States receives an effective action civics education, providing them with the necessary knowledge and skills to participate in our democracy as active citizens. Um, we do this by directly engaging schools in action civics, and as you can probably imagine, we know we'll never be working and supporting every student in the U.S., so the, the other side, which we'll go into more in the theory of change, is simultaneously building demand for the concept across the country. Um, and we ultimately envision a country where everyone's led by young people working together as active and, and effective citizens. Absolutely. And, and, uh, Similarly, in running parallel to that, the, the Youth Ottawa uh, vision is one of a, an Ottawa, so we're a little more local, obviously, than Generation Citizen, but an Ottawa or youth drive remarkable and positive change. Um, so there's a, a little bit of addition there. It's not just that we think youth should be given the opportunity to make change. We also have the belief that our community is a better place when youth have a say in the way the shaping of their communities. So we make it our mission to engage, encourage, and empower youth to take action in our community. Um, and the DILA program, which, again, derives from the Generation Citizen Program, is really a, it's an outreach program, an initial attempt or opportunity for youth to become involved in creating those solutions. So our ultimate theory of change has this vision on the upper right-hand corner. I realize that it's, it's a lot of density for one slide, but a vision on the right-hand corner of how our democracy functions when young people are engaged and everyone's active and participating together. Um, 
the two kind of bubbles in the middle. On the left-hand side, this focuses on the direct service that we're doing um, in the classroom. This focuses on us delivering a high-quality action civics education uh, in classes and offering our program up as one model of what action civics can look like. The other um, newer strand of our work on the right-hand side is building demand for an action civics education. Um, part of the challenge that we confront in our work in the States um, is lack of, um, Ian spoke of the college and career readiness orientation of schools today. What we found is that civics education is by and large not a priority, not necessarily of our teachers or administrators, but of the way that our educational system structure that would support them doing really high quality work here. Um, and we want to help change the national conversation around that so that action civics practitioners um, and educators all over the country have more support um, in those in those overarching intentions. Yeah, uh, and so Sarah talked about a dense slide, and I actually think this is a very nice streamlined theory of change. Uh, I think it actually reads very beautifully. Uh, I say that all leading to our theory of change, which is nowhere near as, uh, as smooth as Sarah. So what I've done is don't worry about the minutia of all this, um, because once you get involved in these, there's a whole bunch of different bells and whistles that go on. Uh, so what I really try to do is, if you looked in the, the previous slide, so if you look at uh, the Generation Citizen Theory of Change, they've got these localized hubs where students receive the, the Generation Citizen program in schools. And the other side, they have to actually advocate to get more schools or more um, school boards and, and state legislatures to legislate that education into it. We're very fortunate in Ontario, we don't have to worry about this side as much because it's already in there. And actually, three years ago, we came up with a revamped civics curriculum where a full third of it was devoted to teaching students about active and engaged citizenship. So it's there. We don't have to worry about the advocating quite as much. Um, what we are finding, however, and this ties to Youth Ottawa and DILA's uh, 10 years of experience running a youth conference in Ottawa, is one of the problems we have is that the action citizen, the opportunities to engage, um, aren't getting everybody. So even though the civics course is open to all students and all students have to take it, one of the problems we were noticing is that it's about 10% of the student population is doing about 80% of the volunteer work, whether it's, you know, trying to help a fundraise for a school that's being built in uh, Guatemala or whether it is, you know, trying to help out um, with the Syrian refugees who are coming, which is a very topical issue right now. Uh, but what they're doing is they're getting overspread. So what we've theorized here, and that's where the big white box I'm talking about, is having a coordinated outreach approach to all youth give all youth an opportunity to learn active citizenship by actually doing it, by actually having a, you know, a small or a huge scale action plan which makes a difference in their community. And then from that we can kind of triage that and say, okay, so if we have over-engaged youth, let's find them, either developed ourselves or through communities or partners in the community, let's find them those uh, uh, opportunities where they can go more in depth into an issue based on the leadership skills. And for those who are not yet engaged, Let's figure out what barriers are there and try and remove them in uh, priority neighborhoods. That could be something like introducing income offset. But again, the, the kind of key here is that coordinated. We're not trying to do it all on our own and really operating the idea of being local to Ottawa. How can we coordinate and work with our other partners to outreach to youth, give them opportunities to either take that first step or even take those first steps they've, they've taken and then promote the impacts they need help coordinate the next step opportunities and connect them with like-minded youth and community organizations who want to work on the same issues. So um, Ian and I want to share a little bit about the uh, frameworks underlying our curricular models um, and then the implementation of that differs DILA versus GC a little bit. Um, so on the left-hand side of your screen now, I want to introduce you to what we affectionately refer to as the Advocacy Hourglass. And our ultimate goal, ideally our students end up executing really wonderful and successful projects in the classroom. Um, however, acknowledging that they've got 10 weeks and 20 classroom periods to accomplish that work, what we ultimately care about most is that students walk away from the GC program uh, having internalized a strategy and a process for driving change on issues that they care about. So the Advocacy Hourglass 
Arts is what we use to demonstrate that process of change making. Um, what we first ask students to do is brainstorm community issues. And you'll notice that this is the widest part of the hourglass because they're brainstorming every issue under the sun that's relevant and really immediate to their lives. And we ask students to focus on school-based issues, neighborhood-based issues, city-based issues, or in our smaller states like Rhode Island and Massachusetts, uh, even state-based issues where they may be able to drive change. After they've put a lot of community issues on the table, we ask them to narrow um, and reach consensus as a class on one focus issue that they want to turn their attention to for the full semester. This could be everything from pedestrian safety in the neighborhood around the school to police community relationships in the city to school leadership uh, hierarchies within the campus itself. After students identify a focus issue, we have them do research and look specifically at policy and programs and other structural causes is contributing to the problem they've identified. Um, after which they've identified a root cause, it's easy for them to flip that on its head and set a really specific goal. From the specificity of that goal, we ask them to identify targets, being either the single decision maker who can help them achieve their goal, or the influencers that other groups or individuals who either are invested in their topic or who hold some sway with their decision maker whom they might mobilize to help support their plan. And then lastly, they identify tactics. What are the individual actions and behaviors that they're going to take in order to put their plan into action? So that's essentially the whole sequence of the semester, which tightly correlates to our overarching curriculum framework, which is on the right side of your screen. We do um, an introductory observation period at the beginning of the term. We uh, then have a first introductory lesson. Then throughout lessons two through seven, you'll notice that students are essentially working through that advocacy hourglass one lesson at a time, taking some time in lesson eight to plan and structure and sequence their action. And then in, in the orange headings parts, that's our third unit taking action, where students are literally divided into small student groups in the classroom, each group either focusing on one independent target or one unique tactic that they're uh, executing in the classroom, whether it's making calls, writing letters, organizing an assembly, etc. All of this leads up to, we hope, a presentation to classes decision makers at the very least, we also sponsor an end of semester event for students called Civics Day, which is a science fair style opportunity where all of our classes from each city come together to present their projects and their progress to local community leaders um, and supporters of the organization and their, their teachers and their administrators. And this is a really important time for students to get feedback on their projects as well as ideas for how they might sustain and continue the work, uh, to network, to take pride and present what they've accomplished thus far, and to meet some people and think about what sustained civic engagement might look like for them. And then we've got one final class period post-civic stay for reflection and identifying next steps. And it is a, a wonderful program, which, uh, again, we are very grateful for being able to um, have borrowed from you with your generosity. Uh, <laughs> Our pleasure. No, the the yeah. one other, sorry, Ian, the, yeah. the other thing that I can't recall if I've mentioned here structurally about the GC model is that our uh, curriculum in our core program is co-facilitated by college volunteers and classroom teachers. Um, college volunteers going in to this one assigned class over the course semester and adding a little bit of capacity to our teachers who are implementing the program in their classrooms. Um, and I only bring that up so that if y'all have questions about it later, we can we can go there. And Absolutely. Asking. Yeah, good point. Yeah, and so we have a very similar model. Uh, so again, you will notice this is a deal adaptation. You'll notice that we have the advocacy hourglass once again. Um, the biggest adaptation that we have had to make to the program is that whereas there's 20 visits with uh, the Generation Citizen program, because you're visiting with students over the course of an entire semester, 
uh, because we focus for the civics class, we effectively have eight weeks to work with a given class, which gives us eight visits. So we've really had to condense it. Now that's offset by the advantage we have here in Ontario by again the fact that we have a curriculum that is already covering a lot of the civic knowledge issues, right? Talking about the different levels of government or talking about you know what is judicial power, what is um, executive power, that kind of stuff. So we don't have to worry about that too much. Uh, so what we've done again, we focus on commu the community issues. Um, everything's pretty much similar to what Sarah said. The one kind of tweak we've had to make is when it comes to focusing an issue. Uh, we've really had to focus more on, uh, and Generation Citizen does this too, but we've had to go even further, focusing on consensus rather than debate. So we break it down in a unit one, we call it inquiry-based learning, which can be effectively described as going to a learner and saying, what do you want to learn about? What interests you? But this is very difficult. We have a class of 30 individuals who are all interested in different things. So we really... Um, it's important to have something that everyone can get into or behind, everyone can buy into, uh, but we also have to downplay like what is most important. Um, so we can find something very quickly, get to the meat of it, which really is let's go through actually making a difference, uh, which leads to, again, we call this second part, and again, this is very similar to the Generation Citizen model, we call it cognitive apprenticeship, which is let's do this together, because our model or way that we envision and we've seen works best when dealing with youth and helping to empower them is, you know, we don't have to inspire youth or tell them what's wrong with the world. They know that. We don't have to make them care because by and large, uh, the younger you are, the more intensely you feel injustice. All right, so it, it's there. And we don't have to give them great ideas because frankly their ideas are way better than mine. So they've got that. What they need is they've never organized an event. They've never lobbied a politician. They've never sent a letter let alone a letter to government in most cases. So our facilitators, who for the most part are drawn from the University of Ottawa's Bachelor of Education program, will go in and work with a partner teacher, and really the meat and potatoes is getting something everyone kind of get behind, and then figuring out, okay, what's your creative solution? Now let's go through the tactics. Let's go through, all right, we're gonna organize an awareness raising event and get people to sign a petition. Well, how do we do a petition? Here's a tool for that. Let's do this together. And that's where the facilita facilitator will come in and supply that. Uh, so very similar to Generation Citizen, we go and work in schools. For us, it actually winds up being four, four rounds per year of about eight to nine weeks each. Um, and then we also try and follow up with those opportunities, those showcase events. So we have, um, at the end of the year, the Youth Action Showcase, which is, as Sarah said, it's um, a science fair, but for civics projects. But we add in the category, it's also crossed with speed dating. But here we're matching promising youth with community leaders who can help take the next step. Uh, so again, very similar to what Generation Citizen does. Uh, the goal of that is, you know, it could be an opportunity to speak to uh, Ottawa City Councilors to be pulled at Ottawa City Hall. Uh, it could be an opportunity to even lobby the mayor, for example, to change the way the city defines homelessness, which is something that happened at our last uh, um, showcase. Uh, and the final step that we have in addition, and this is where DILA got its start actually 10 years ago, is we have a youth conference every year where we invite about 500 youth from across Ottawa to come in and learn about the actions being taken in their community on a, a range of social environmental issues, uh, which they could get a part of. Uh, since we started in-school programming, now we can start inviting past deal action groups to present those workshops to other youth. So it's a youth-led, youth-inspired model. Okay, so for part two, we're going to talk about results and evaluation. We'll quickly talk on, uh, or touch on the scope of our programming. Um, and then for the second part, we're going to talk about, uh, each of us will talk about one exemplary action plan, so you can get a better sense of what does the end product look like. And then we'll talk about the evaluation protocols used and the feedback that we received and, and the lessons that we can draw from that. Thanks, Ian. So just a overall snapshot, Generation Citizen was formally incorporated in 2010. So we're about five years old and work in New York City, greater Boston area, the San Francisco Bay area, and mostly in Providence, but somewhat throughout the state of Rhode Island. Um, we've worked with 93 schools last year programming. We call our college volunteers democracy coaches, so over 250 last year, and are serving at this point about 7,400, 7,600 students a year. Yeah, and for us, we, uh, again, much 
uh, more local in our focus. We focus just on Ottawa. We uh, work extensively in both the Ottawa Carleton District School Board and the Ottawa Catholic District School Board through the partnerships we've developed with them. Uh, we've worked in about 28 of those high schools to date over the past three years, um, and we've been very blessed in having well over 100 now uh, facilitators come in, mostly from the Bachelor of Education program. There's been some wonderful people who have helped us to uh, take over 4,000 youth through our program. So again, the, the, the um, talking about the scope of that is just to emphasize that uh, um, it's given, I, I'll speak for myself at least, given me a lot of opportunities to uh, learn from my mistakes perhaps and learn by <laughs> things that maybe didn't work really well. So yeah, uh, you can, the lessons, you can speak for both of us, yes. <laughs> yeah, the lessons we're drawing here, I want to emphasize, we come by them honestly. Great. So I uh, used to work specifically on our New York team and now work on our national team and want to share a story with you of a classroom that we worked with last spring in Providence, Rhode Island. So the pictures here are of students at the Winita Sanchez Educational Complex, one of our partner schools in Providence who last spring were concerned about their peers learning about domestic and dating violence. So that was their focus issue and school staff being aware of the warning signs of domestic and dating violence and how to address this. So for their action project, they met with influencers, including health teachers, the Women's Center of Providence, and other students, and then they actually organized and held a meeting, which you can see here on the top and left-hand side, with the uh, district superintendent, the head nurse of the Providence Public School District, their own health teachers at the school, and two members of outside organizations who give trainings on these subjects. So part of the GC programming that we've woven in the past years has been really emphasizing collaboration with outside organizations, support of ongoing and current campaigns, and the utilization of guest speakers inside or outside of the classrooms as students schedule their own meetings. So we actually learned uh, a, a few months ago that the district is going to be allocating resources this year for professional development for all school staffers in Providence on dating violence uh, this coming fall. Which is really cool. Yeah, and it's just an example of um, our students doing a really local issue, something very uh, immediate and relevant to their lives, and driving specific tactical change, I guess, with local uh, local partners. Absolutely, and, and it's, uh, I think one of the things came up from that one too, and, and we'll talk about it in the example of DEAL action plan, but it's addressing not only a root cause, but also a systemic and even like a legislative mm -hmm. cause. It's getting to see a link between the way laws are passed and made and enforced, has an impact on their everyday lives. In turn, their everyday lives can have an impact on those laws being passed, uh, negotiated, and enforced. Uh, so, like Sarah, she's talking about the importance of bringing in an outside community port partner. Uh, the action plan that I would like to discuss is one that I um, partnered with a teacher at uh, a local high school here last year to work on helping youth who are experiencing homelessness. And we were so fortunate to be able to work with uh, the team in the middle I apologize for the, the blurry picture. It was the best I had from the, the day, but uh, they're the Street Smarts, a wonderful group that goes out and does outreach with persons who are experiencing homelessness every night. Um, they came in and did just a phenomenal job of, A, helping to better inform youth about the issue that's out there. Like, if you want to learn about an issue, go to the experts. Okay, go to the people who, who have lived experience in that. They, they work with that milieu every day. Uh, but more importantly, they approach the youth with, some, with such a, a great amount of respect, like, hey, here's how you can help us. So what this turned into, and what I really liked about this, is a bunch of things. So one, we had a phenomenal community partner we were able to connect the kids with. And I really think in any kind of action plan you do with youth, the, the greater the connections you can make, whether it's between the youth in the class, whether it's with youth, other youth in the school, maybe other you know, social justice clubs or a, an audio tech crew who can put together a video for them with administration, with other teachers in their community. Uh, the more of those connections you can make, the stronger the action plan and the stronger the impact it has on predicting like future engagement. It's, it's a bit like you know, building muscle mass, right? Muscles work by um, stressing the connective tissue in fibers. And the more connective tissue you can have, the, more, the stronger your muscle, the stronger your, your, your ability there. 
uh, I had a phenomenal teacher to work with. He was just amazing. Uh, it was not me leading this charge, and it was not just the youth kind of stepping up. It was also teaching an amazing job of supporting them and helping them um, in other parts when I wasn't there. And what I really liked, probably two other things about this that I'll talk about, was how differentiated it was. So the meat of the action plan was to try and advocate the city to, they had just slashed their budget for um, social services and kind of the low hanging fruit that got cut was outreach work. So there's not as much outreach being done. In fact, there's very little and they're being stressed out in that. So it was an opportunity to advocate and to um, lobby the mayor. And the picture on the right is one of the youth from the class and she is um, lobbying Mayor Jim Watson. And that's at our Youth Action Showcase. So they're able to get to that connected point. Now, she didn't have, and they didn't have as much success yet in uh, arguing for return for funding, although other groups have met with other city councillors who are more uh, who are sympathetic towards that. Uh, but another part of it, and what I loved with this project was how differentiated it was. There were multiple points of entry where everyone could get involved. So if we look over the picture on the left, they also organized a three-point shooting contest. And uh, I think one of the students in the class had season tickets to the local Ottawa Red Blacks and offered them as a prize. And the winner of the three-point shooting contest got them. Entry to this was given by bringing in the donations that Street Smarts needed for their outreach work. So this happened at lunchtime. And you notice the, the two girls who were sitting at the table there, they were largely responsible for organizing it. The other boys were responsible for setting up the tournament and refereeing it. There was a video that got made. So everyone was given an opportunity to buy in and do this project. Uh, and the final thing, again, that I really loved about this and how it was such a success uh, was not only did they get to help the community partner out, not only get to advocate and work on those systemic issues with the city, but also they got to go to Youth Action Showcase. And then they also did an amazing job presenting at our youth conference this year and inspiring for the youth to take action. So Ian and I wanted to share a little bit about how we evaluate our programs. Um, as opposed to other types of education, programs that that we've both been a part of, uh, we can't offer specific data about how our program impacts student attendance or impacts graduation rates or passing um, related college career readiness tests. But academics in the field of action civics agree that there are three indicators that you can see here that best predict the likelihood of students' intended future civic engagement. Uh, so that's what we really want to evaluate our students' growth on. So those three metrics are civic knowledge, meaning the understanding the basic structures and processes of how the political process works and how citizens can impact that process. Civic skills focused on the skills needed to effectively participate in the political process, including collaboration, persuasive communication, critical thinking, and then lastly, civic motivation, how inclined students are to actually participate in that process. And this includes uh, commitment to community, understanding of responsibility, and uh, belief that students can actually affect and make change in their communities. So uh, on the right-hand side, you can see snapshots of data, which I'm happy to share offline or available on our website too. Um, we assess these primarily through pre- and post-surveys of students at the beginning and end of the semester, as well as um, mid- and end-of-semester surveys of our teachers and our democracy coaches. So on the one hand, on, on these bars on the left-hand side, we are offering information about uh, scores from our students' assessment. And on the right-hand side, we also offer information about our teachers' perceptions of their students' development. Um, so one, not caution, but one piece of learning that I want to offer as you wade into this work uh, or wade into it more deeply yourself is um, it's very difficult to assess students' skill development and especially motivation development um, from a written assessment. So for example, skill development 
what we really want to assess is not only do students believe that they've developed skills, which is what a written test can tell us, but do they actually have the skills? Um, not only do they have more confidence in communicating, but are they communicating more effectively, which is hard to put down on paper. What we've also noticed about assessing student civic motivation is that um, the scores might not necessarily represent the entire picture. So civic motivation itself, what we found is often students come in with a high baseline of believing that they can drive change, for example, or um, yes, let's use that as an example. Uh, through the course of the program, students are learning a lot about the process of what driving change actually looks like. And very often, they'll discover that, lo and behold, driving change is hard. Um, and their motivation might dip in terms of what's reflected on the surveys, but it's actually a more realistic estimation of their newfound knowledge of both about what it takes to be politically active. Uh, so it might be accurate, but, but it might not be the best holistic picture of what students are actually learning and taking away from the program, which is why we try to kind of triangulate that data between teachers, students, and then in-person classroom observations and occasionally smaller focus groups with students as well. Yeah, and, and <laughs> we have uh, much less to contribute in the line of evaluation. And that's one thing that Sarah will talk about at the end as we talk about lessons learned is uh, it requires a lot of resources to be able to do mm -hmm. effective evaluation. Um, and right now, uh, our resources on our program consists of uh, uh, myself and my executive director. Uh, so uh, not as much as we would like to, to make everything happen. Um, so we have a much smaller basis to draw upon in terms of the evaluation. We also have done pre and post surveys um, really based on some academic models where it's per youth self-reported uh, perceived civic, civic competencies that we're testing and it's been shown to be a good predictor of future engagement. Now we haven't actually concerned ourselves with the question of are they necessarily effective communicators and that's part in part because we benefit from partnering so closely with the school boards right and the great thing is that I know these teachers right friends of mine they're doing a great job of making sure that these kids can communicate. They're actually tying a lot of their uh, summative projects at the end of the term around deal and seeing, can you write a persuasive letter? So it's great because I don't have to worry about that. I was like, oh man, this job is made easier. Uh, but one of the things we found is, oops, I went back. One of the things that we really found was important is that sense of I can. And Sarah also talked about the problem of sometimes when you try and make change, the problems are just astronomical. And our shortcut around that, because there are some huge problems out there, right? I mean, you just have to look in Canada, the, the, the national uh, discourse around uh, the Energy East pipeline, for example. That's a hugely contentious issue. There are a ton of players, right? You are not going to impact in eight weeks a decision on that all on your own. So we really try and caution that instead of like, we're going out to change the world, we're going out to change a part of it, right? And let's, you know, I always tell the youth I work with, like, let's be fair to you. Have you ever gone and done this before? Most of them say no. I say, listen, we're just asking you to become part of the solution, right? Just join a bunch of others who are already working on it. That's where we build those connections with the community. So it's really about scaling their achievements, right? And we talk about a lot of SMART goals. What represents represent success? Well, maybe we didn't change the mayor's mind, but we did meet the city councillor who agrees with us. So that's one of them. Uh, we were able to do uh, our executive director, Jason Collar, who founded DILA um, 10 years ago. He did his master of education on this education intervention that DLA is. And the conclusion was that DLA has a statistically significant impact on promoting youth democratic engagement. Uh, and again, based on those pre and post surveys, uh, what we found to kind of keep some things that surprised us that actually the end result of the action plan wasn't as important as taking them through the process of helping them kind of walk through, okay, if you want to have this event where everything's cool and everybody's shooting three point shots, Man, you gotta do a lot of work. You gotta do some event coordination, right? So take into that process, even if the event doesn't actually take place, had a huge empowering impact, which really surprised us. Um, youth buy-in is imperative. Uh, there's a couple of cases where it didn't go well, and what had happened was, when we look back on it, the youth had been ventriloquized, right? And uh, you know, I will own up to that one where it was like, well, I think what you really need is this, and that wasn't what they meant. It wasn't what they wanted to work on. And the third point that I'm going to drive from our evaluation that was 
um, also uh, fairly significant, is that the community partner, right, that can make all the difference in the world. That ability to connect with someone who will not just come in and give the kids a PowerPoint presentation about, you know, all the great things that their organization is doing, but meet with them honestly and say, like, hey, we need your help. That makes all the difference in the world. Okay, so for part three, before we move on to questions here, Sarah and I are both going to share some guiding principles and lessons learned, and we're going to do this from a, a macro and a micro level. So Sarah's going to talk about the do list for building up a program. If, you know, there's no deal or generation citizen type thing in your community already, you think, hey, that'd be really cool to try. Here's some things for that kind of broad-based program startup. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about 10 suggestions to do when you're actually in the class and working with, or in a, in a group, working with a group of people. Sure. So we have four overarching suggestions here. The first suggestion is to network. When we first started out at GC, we obviously realized the importance of networking with school partners in order to support them in running action civics programming. We knew that we needed volunteers, um, but there were two things we neglected. One, as I'm sure you know, there's a lot of turnover at schools and at colleges, whether it's folks leaving the classroom, uh, graduating from school, or uh, going from one school to another. So the approach that we now use is what we call the rule of threes, where it's our intention that at every partner school with whom we work and on every college campus, we make sure that we're building relationships with at least three individuals, whether it is someone at the front desk, a principal, a teacher, a guidance counselor, uh, a director of social studies, or the same correlations on the college level. Um, we want to make sure that we're building a sustainable program that isn't disrupted necessarily or isn't upon the maintenance of one person um, or the, the extra effort of one person over another. The second network that we found out was really important for us to build were, were relationships with community partners. So an organization like Street Smarts, organizations that are dealing with the whole host of issues that our students are focusing on. The nice thing about doing a program like this is we've really got the opportunity to have a conversation with almost any local change maker or advocate in hopes that one day they can be a resource for our students and our students a resource for them. Um, and the more that we build close relationships here, the easier it is to connect folks to our classes as guest speakers, to connect them for meetings, uh, and lobbying opportunities and to invite them to end of semester either in school or broader city-based civics day events. Point two that I don't want to neglect is focusing a lot of attention on the people who will run your program. Uh, so on the one hand, this means that uh, we need to be really intentional and specific about whom we work with because so much rests upon the ability of our volunteers and our teachers to create an environment that's maybe a little less structured than some of the environments that their uh, students are used to working in, but student-driven and student-centered. Um, and this is a really big responsibility for which a lot of training and support is required. Um, the other thing related to this point is the importance of adopting a customer service attitude. So our students are obviously the main beneficiaries of our program, but in order for us to have an impact on our students, we've got to make make sure that we're treating our volunteers and teachers right um, in order for them to have a positive experience and continue to do this really important and difficult work. Point three, um, sound and timely program evaluation is key and requires an investment of resources. I don't want to shortchange that. Um, we like to approach evaluation not as a red light or green light on whether or not the program is good or is bad, but as an opportunity to learn about what's working best and what areas need the most attention. But doing this work is really hard. Part of our demand building efforts at GC actually relate to bringing in more resources and attention to the sphere so that philanthropists and funders and even school districts are, are are able to invest more resources in evaluation work, which is so important as we continue to learn about what's best supporting our students and how to do this work even better. 
Um, and then the last recommendation that we really have is build in some sort of platform for external recognition for your young people, whether that's a broad, large city-based event like the Youth Action Showcase or Civics Day, or whether that's even an internal school event, a school assembly, or another sort of meeting where students get to present the work that they've been doing to um, other stakeholders, uh, community members, and most importantly, adult leaders, and have the opportunity to be listened to and heard. All right, and just looking at the time here, because I want to leave some time for you to ask some questions, uh, I'll go quickly through the, the guiding principles for the do list for implementing the program with you. So really, I mean, so much of it comes down to building relationship. You have to approach it from a position um, as a facilitator. So I'm a teacher, but I call my role in the classroom one as facilitator. One, I recognize that there is already a teacher in the classroom. But when I'm working with youth, uh, I want to come at the approach that they have something to offer, I have something to offer, and in the middle we'll meet. So the first thing I say is be the change. Youth might listen to what you say, and anyone who's a parent will know what I'm talking about, but they absolutely will follow what you do and mimic what you do. Uh, a great way to kind of tell what your behavior is like is to watch your kids. This is a shortcut there. Uh, so be the change. Model the behavior of a respectful democratic citizen. Number two is, tie this a bit, your attitude. Um, I can't say enough. Be caring, open-minded, and reserve judgment. I think one of the, the worst things that you could say, especially at the start of the process, is no. I always say yes and, right? Try and broad through, like, any time a youth will give you something as an idea, especially the youth we work at the grade 10 level, um, understand that's a risk-taking statement for them and be respectful of the fact they've offered something, even if it's something kind of perhaps silly. Like, we have had an action plan uh, sent around, you know, student stress and building in a yoga center that basically stemmed from uh, one of my colleagues hearing one of the youth in the back room saying, well, I don't feel like I get enough sleep. I like sleep, you know, trying to be a bit of a class clown. And that led into, let's get a yoga room, let's get a meditation room, let's get a relaxation room. Uh, number three, channel youth is pa youth's passions and ideas. Because again, they're more likely better ears. That's what they bring to the table. Far more, I think, than, and I'll call myself out, old people like myself. Uh, number four, this is the one thing here. Build consensus rather than fostering debate. Debate is part of a healthy democracy, but debate is also the enemy of action. Debate is also the enemy of a group of people coming together to get something done. It prevents that small group of thoughtful citizens from changing the world in some way. So we really actually, our first lesson, uh, and I'm pretty sure we draw this from Generation Citizen as well, is an unlearn moment. Unlearn your critical mindset. Let's see what do we have in common and work from there rather than you know, all of our personal um, biggest issues to, to follow on. Uh, number five, connect, connect, connect. Right? I talked about earlier this, the importance of building that connective tissue, which is the, the, the base of what moves a, democrat, a democratic society. Uh, number six, I mentioned this term before. I might elaborate on what it means, differentiate. In Ontario, we, uh, as teachers, are asked to differentiate all the time because we know that different people learn differently. Different people have different skills. Different people have different interests. So uh, have multiple entry points for people to get involved. You might have a bunch of kids in your room who are super passionate about gaming. You might think, how does that possibly have anything to do with civic engagement? But when you're talking about refugees in general, the Syrian refugees, all of a sudden they went and found me a game called Darfur is Dying, this group of boys who are interested in gaming. And it was about how difficult it is to live in Darfur if you're a refugee, which was kind of interesting. So you never know, right? Uh, differentiate, find multiple entry points for people to get involved. Uh, number seven, and this goes with number two, or sorry, number three. So youth bring passion ideas. We provide the training wheels. This will be the first time through the scaffold. Maybe they've never written a letter before. Help them with it, right? That's, that's no disservice to them. Help to figure out a way to channel their ideas. Sometimes they need training wheels. Sometimes they're ready to fly on their own. Number eight, encourage youth to dream big, but plan in concrete, manageable steps. So again, that talks about some of these issues are huge. What is a concrete, local, manageable step that we can work towards? Number nine, uh, I got this one from my wife. Uh, perfect is the enemy of done, right? And it's actually really good to emphasize for youth we work at, work with, that it's not going to be perfect. But we're going to learn from the process. And we'll do it differently next time. And number 10 is 
tied to that, don't be afraid to fail, right? Success in civics can take a long, long time. So that is all that Sarah and I had for you. I think we'll, we'll open it up to the moderators for any questions that might have come in. And thank you very much for your time coming and listening to us talk today. Um, we don't have a lot of time left for questions, um, but I can, I'll, I'll start off with one and we'll see how many, um, how many we can get to. Um, the first one that I want to ask you is around the, um, idea of the, the coaches, the democracy coaches or the, the train, um, I wonder if you can imagine them as um, mentors, A, and B, also someone wants to know what kind of training do these support supporters receive? Sure. Sarah, do you want to go first? Sure, and I'll try to be brief. We actually used to call our democracy coaches mentors, but I think that that was setting up an inappropriate expectation of the type of relationship that our DCs would have in the classroom, of our mentors would have in the classroom. Um, they're mentors in the sense that we want them to be civic role models, but we don't want them to be working exclusively with one student, but rather with the entire class, and not necessarily leading the way so much as a coach is kind of pushing and supporting from behind. Um, mm -hmm. Our training consists of a weekend-long initial training where they're taught everything from how our curriculum works to local politics refresher to working in the classroom with teachers and students, and then weekly meetings with other volunteers on their college campus as they go throughout the year. Yeah, and I'll echo everything Sarah said about the, the mentor aspect, and, and, and we, again, that kind of um, pushing from behind rather than leading the way forward. Uh, with our, most of our facilitators are already teachers, so a lot of our, um, our program focuses on just taking them through the basic philosophies behind it. What are we talking about? So we do, you know, a big training at the start, and then we have a midpoint meeting between the coordinator and the facilitators, to myself, um, on an individual basis later on. Because one of the things I found is that this is such an organic process that the deeper you go into it, the more differently each one goes. Mm -hmm. So it's an opportunity to kind of check in and give those, um, you know, because I've been through so many times, like, here's something you might want to try. So that's why we really we designed two distinct units. Our, our first unit, that inquiry-based learning, trying to get what kids are interested in what they want to do, that's fairly kind of regimented and laid out, and we cover that in the initial training. And then once they get to that point, they meet with me, we figure out what are all the tactics and the tools that we need to give to youth to help them carry it out. Mm -hmm. Thank, thanks so much. Um, another question is about um, how these action teams are built. Um, are they, do they, the action teams come together out of a shared interest? Um, or is, is one question and then the follow-up question is around if they're if they don't begin with shared interest, could you talk a little bit about how you work towards um, consensus without losing people because it becomes too general? Yeah, sure. Um, so briefly, in our program, teachers and democracy coaches are free to figure out how to assign those groups. Um, we uh, ask in an exit ticket from one lesson which of these either topics or which of these tactic, tactics would you be most interested in? And then between generation citizen class periods, our teachers and democracy coaches mm -hmm. put them in groups ideally that they've expressed interest in. Um, and I do think that that's a great point that's really important in sustaining their engagement. So even if one is working on a poster campaign while the others are writing an article, it's a really good way to give them something that they can really sink their teeth into. Yeah, absolutely. Do that too. Uh, I think the other way is to set the expectation right from the start. Um, and, and we really do that. Like we have a conversation about talking about, um, you know, there's a lot of things that grind my gears. I imagine there's a lot of things that grind your gears as well. So we talk about all the issues up on the board, right? They're all over the place. We see them. Let's talk about all the ones that we could get behind that are worthwhile because our focus is not on the issue itself necessarily. Like we, we use that as kind of the basis for it. Which is like, let's learn what to do about it. And then if you, you know, learn those skills, then you go back to those ones that you're super passionate about, right? So we try and condition from the start uh, and, and try and find out, like, where is the most buy-in? Um, you know, 
So we'll have a, you know, usually like a short list of five or six different issues. Uh, we'll give them challenges for like, give me an image of what each of these looks like. And then we'll say, okay, you can vote. We're going to vote for each one and just tell me if you think this is something that you would really think is worthwhile to get behind. And that's how we kind of figured out doing also those exit ticket type things where, okay, write me your top three and why or something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another question that just came in um, is, uh, will matter very much on context, but um, I, I, I know that this happens. How do you handle it if the students want their change project to be directed at the very school in which they are based? <laughs> oh, my. Great question. I think that um, depending upon if you're thinking from the uh, perspective of an outside organization like DILA and GC, or if you're actually in charge of your own classroom, this might differ. From GC's perspective, we talk a lot about this with teachers, making sure that teachers are keeping their administrators kept in the loop about what students are talking about so that when it comes time for either a decision maker meeting with their principal or civics day, administrators are not taken by surprise mm -hmm. and don't very quickly put the kibosh then on whatever students have been spending so much time and building so much energy around. Um, so school-based projects are fine in our mind as long as they're still strategic in the sense of what they're trying to accomplish and responsible in the sense of how they're going about it, but keeping your administrators looped in is going to be really important. And if, if it has to come time to change topics, that's going to be a really important conversation to have and a difficult one to have with students, but one which I wouldn't gloss over because otherwise it risks uh, demotivating students pretty quickly. Absolutely. And, and again, lessons learned the hard way. Um, we learned the hard way. Uh, that one class we worked with wanted to propose a pajama day to, you know, raise funds to support a local animal shelter. And, you know, that's been passed at so many different schools that I didn't think anything of it. Um, this was one of our facilitators working with it, and it came back that, nope, they're not allowed to wear pajamas at that school. So, absolutely, communication with administration is paramount. Uh, you know, the, the idea of dress code is something that comes up quite a bit. And... When you know the different administrators at schools, like there are some schools I wouldn't have tried this at, um, but I know one of the principals at a school very well where um, she was thinking of introducing uniforms to a school that had no uniforms. Um, and the students were talking about they didn't want that. But knowing that she's, you know, amenable, the teacher and I approached her and said, so this is kind of what they're interested in. And um, she's a big supporter of the process and the, and the way to go. She said, no problem. So she came and talked to him. She laid out the reasons why she wanted to do it. And she suggested to them that they were more than welcome to use democratic means to, you know, challenge that. Getting so they, they arranged a student vote, and it was cool because we actually uh, we got to collect, connect them with Elections Canada to talk about how to run a fair and impartial vote. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, there's, you know, that's because that that principle there was in my mind, uh, you know, one of the most amazing individuals I've come across. There's a lot of the principles would do that, and there's some schools where it's not the principle. The community just simply can't let that happen. So. Communication is key. We're getting to um, past 2 o'clock right now. There are um, other questions, but um, in the, out of respect for everyone's time, I think we'll end it now. But we will take um, all the remaining questions and respond to them on our uh, post-webinar blog. So at this moment, um, I'd like to thank everyone um, for joining us.